Where's Avi Hal? Ik hard to Kevin. This video is going to exercise the idea that Shaf or Shava is a deity and explore the nature of this deity. What is Shava like? What are his qualities? Okay. Um, I just want as well, I like to say that this is not arguing uh, for what people believed in the past. This is not uh, going to be, um, it's going to talk about historical sources and, you know, using them, what, what can we do with them for the, for the present and then, and as well as going to uh, the future. Things can change over time, but can stay true to what is eternal. Okay, gold is gold. The only difference is in words, uh, but the reality stays the same. Water is wet, fire is hot. One plus one equals two. These things are eternal. Many ways you can say one plus one equals two, it, uh, but in the end, it's still one plus one equals two. Water is wet, fire is hot. Okay, I just want to get that out of the way because I know I'll have a lot of reconstructionists uh, or very hi uh, big history buffs uh, that are going to come after me or what have you. Anyway. So Shava, well, what does this word mean? What does this name mean? Well, Shava uh, later evolved into our English word sheaf. And what is a sheaf? Well, a sheaf is, um, well, it's typically uh, in, in agriculture. It is that thing that binds uh, wheat together, uh, corn, uh, barley, or, but this word can also be used in like a sheaf of papers, uh, a sheaf of roses, if you will. Okay, so this is a very crucial thing to remember throughout this video because it's going to be the, the crux or the main thing that is uh, uh, pertinent. Okay, so historically speaking, Shava is mentioned in Beowulf, Weed Seeth, Roman sources about the Longobards, uh, Paul the Deacon's history of the Longobards, Malmus Buries, uh, Gesta Regnum Ang Anglorum, Avowards, Chronica. Anglo-Saxon genealogies, uh, prologue of the Prose Edda, and when talking about uh, genealogies. Now, the thing is about these genealogies, uh, whether uh, Anglo-Saxon or Norse or what have you of this time, you have this thing called uh, uh, euhemerization. Uh, this needs to be pointed out. What, what, what does that mean, that big word I just said? Euhemerization was a, uh, a technique used by... Um, Christians to undermine the validity of pagan gods. You know, they would say like, "Oh yeah, this this god you worship, <coughs> excuse me, this god you worship." Now, uh, yeah, well, a long time ago, he was just a person just like you. Moving on to read from Malmesbury's uh, William uh, Malmesbury's uh, Gesta Regnum Anglorum. Um, he writes about Shava. He writes about Shava and giving a little story. Uh, that, that, that's associated with them. So Shaf, okay, I'll read, it, I'll read it to you now. Shaf, who, as some affirm, was driven on a certain island in Germany called Skansa, of which Jordane, Jordandes, no, so pardon me, Jor, Jornandes, um, the historian of the Goths, speaks. A little boy in a skiff without any, at, with, without any attendant, asleep with a handful of corn at his head. Whence, he was called Shaf, and on account of his singular appearance, being well, being well received by the men of that country, and carefully educated, in his riper age, he reigned in a town which uh, was called Slaswick. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but anyway. But at present, Hathaby, uh, which country called Old Anglia, Old Anglia, whence the Angels came into Britain, is situated between the Saxons and the Goths. Okay, that's that's William of Mal Malmesbury, uh, um, you know, mention of Schaff. And then we're going to have another one from Adelwards, uh, Chronica, uh, mentioned Schaff, and here we go. This Schiff, uh, or I guess it's a, a period, period spelling, anyway, so this Schiff, came into a light boat um, to an island of the ocean to, uh, which is called Ascani. Arms around, arms around about him, he was a very young boy, unknown to the dwellers in the land, 
but he was accepted by them and cared for like one of their own kind. And afterwards, they chose him as king, from whose uh, family descended King Adelwulf. Yeah, this is, um, uh, yeah, it's an example of euhemerization where, like, okay, so this being, yeah, he's, uh, it was a person, and, and therefore, uh, yeah, this king uh, uh, literally descended from him. So, anyway. So, what can we um, learn about Shava as a metaphysical being? Because that's what a deity is, a, a, a metaphysical personality, a divine metaphysical personality. And what do I mean by metaphysical? Well, a metaphysical, you know, it's not, it's not something you can see, you know? It, it, you know, just as you are, we're all ruled by gravity, but you can't see gravity, but you know you're, you, you know of it, you know? Anyway, so... So what what can we learn about Shava in these uh, in these explanations of of, of uh, from uh, these uh, sort Anglo-Saxon sources um, that uh, that Shava he's liked by everyone that, that is with him and uh, he has uh, a, a, a character of leadership positive attributes of a leader why am I saying this because this guy, this 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 character uh, became king and for for someone to be chosen as king. You know, they would have to have qualities, positive, uh, auspicious qualities to become king. So, from there, uh, we can uh, gain ideas of who this guy is. Uh, but by guy, I mean Shava. Anyway. So, anyway. Um, but now, I'm going to talk about a, a secondary source. Um, as opposed to primary. Well, what's the difference between the two? Uh, primary source is basically from the period itself. And secondary is someone from basically today uh, uh, writing about something that happened a long time ago. Anyway, so we're going to uh, go uh, talk about an excerpt from uh, the book um, Schild and Chef Expanding Analogues by Alex Alexander M. Bruce. Link down below. Okay, let's see what this guy has to say. The thing is with it, with his uh, uh, take on Shava that he that he he talks about how like the Longbards known him, the Danes known him, the the well the Scandinavian people know knew about him, uh, the, and the English obviously knew about him. Uh, so yeah, so plenty of people in, in in the Germanic world knew about him, and and he mentions the Roman sources about um, Shava that uh, that the uh, the Longbards they were a fierce tribe and whatnot. Da 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 da. And then uh, he goes on later to say that, um, uh, and I quote, the mythical civilizer who in introduces a, a, amid a hitherto barbarous people tillage of the, of the earth, and with it he settled rule of a king. Uh, then he goes on to say, uh, metaphorically, uh, the, the reference to Sh uh, Chef um, in, in Weed Seath suggests that, uh, that an agricultural way of life with its ability to ensure a more consistent supply of sustenance, ha uh, had the ability to uh, dictate the actions of his, uh, of this people to govern their actions through the governance of their appetites. Oh, wow. This is significant because this says a lot about Shava. Okay? What it says, uh, in a nutshell, that the, the nature of Shava, that he that like he's the one that governs, so he civilizes. Uh, he brings order to chaos. Um, he, yeah, so like tilling the land, uh, you know, uh, bringing order, order to chaos. Um, you know, with the agriculture aspect, he's all, therefore uh, a sustainer of life. You know, agricultural uh, agriculture, you know, involves humans, involves plants, involves uh, animals. So, but going back to the, the name itself, Shava, and what a sheep is is the thing that binds essentially so sustainer of life uh, if you can if you want to go in a deeper um, uh, metaphysical you know if you want to go deeper metaphysically about this you know a binder a, a uh, sorry a part, yeah a, a sustainer he that holds if you will further I know uh, with the with, with the uh, with the excerpt saying about um, governing appetites uh, you know, you, this could suggest that, you know, uh, the nature of Shava, that he's a binder of uh, reality, uh, you know, like, like gravity. He's a binder, you know, governing appetite, you know, but then therefore by extension, uh, the, um, the senses, you know. Um, 
if you will. So a binder of reality. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, something. That, that's what I can get from um, Alexander M. Bruce's in, interpretation of, of, of these uh, Lombardic Ro uh, Roman sources um, and Anglo-Saxon sources, that, you know, as he uh, compiles them together and discussing them in his book, uh, link down below. So, and, and I'm looking at these sources from a more of a metaphysical, uh, Vedantic-like sort of way, all right? Okay, so just to recap, uh, so, the, so the nature of Shava from, from Alexander and Bruce is that, he, uh, that Shava uh, is the one that gov governs, sustainer of all life, binder of reality, if you will. Um, anyway, so moving on, I'm going to talk about another secondary source called The Origins of Beowulf from Vergil to Wielaf. Um, and, and this is interesting uh, because um, there's a Richard North here. Yeah, this is by Richard North. Uh, he, he talks about uh, the, the fable of like the shield and the, and the sheep. Okay, so w what am I talking about? Well, um, Richard North uh, brings up about... Um, Something that happened, uh, well, something that was mentioned in the in, in the Chronicon de Ad Bigdon, which which talked about uh, about a land um, a dispute. Yeah, it says here that yeah, a land a, a dispute uh, with the men of Oxfordshire in the first uh, in the first third of the tenth century, according to this off-sided story, written da 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 da. Okay, so basically with the signs of. Of an Anglo-Saxon origin, the monks placed a sheaf of corn in a round shield and a lit and a lit wax uh, taper over the sheaf, and then pushed the shield out into the river Thames. Uh, Thames. Thames. Um, so the idea behind this would be like, uh, we'll settle this by putting the sheaf and the candle or what have you on the shield, and uh, we'll have fate decide essentially <laughs> wherever this thing goes uh, down the river. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, you know, we, we have, you know, from, from this text that talks about this. Um, but, but, but the context of, um, of what Richard North is talking about here is the relationship between, uh, Shul and, and Chef, uh, yeah, or Shava. Anyway, so for our purposes in this video, putting the idea that Shava is a deity, what can we learn about the nature of, uh, Shava in this context? Well, uh, this is about decision making and whatnot. So therefore, Shava is metaphysically the final say in the matter. Is the divine will, the event. Uh, you know, this is what it is, so to speak. You know, the the conclusion, if you will. I can go on and on and on, make more epithets of this. So yeah, whether uh, people in the Germanic pagan past, you know, had Shava as a deity of worship, we may never know. But what I'm suggesting in this video is that, you know, we can have Shava, we can deify Shava. I, what I'm arguing that there's enough historical evidence that Shava would be a candidate deity to give devotion to. I'm not saying you should. I mean, you could if you want. When I found all this together, I thought, oh, wow, you know, you have this little baby that, you know, loved by all and whatnot. And I'm thinking, like, what is this? The, the Germanic Krishna, if you will? Anyway. I'm looking at this from uh, a perennial point of view, a metaphysical point of view. Yeah, I'm, I'm using the past as an inspiration, all right, for the for the present and the future, all right, for for uh, what is eternal. So anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, Shava is a candidate deity. So anyway, okay. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Um, hit the bell for notifications. And if you want to help out the channel, please become a patron at my Patreon page down below. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.